<laughs> hey everyone, my guests today are the stars of Some Like It Hot on Broadway. They are Natasha Yvette Williams and Kevin Del Agula. I'm going to read a very short bio for each of them so we can jump into their glorious show and their glorious performances. Some highlights of Natasha's Broadway career include Tina, the Tina Turner musical, Chicken and Biscuits, Waitress Chicago, A Night with Janis Joplin, The Gershwin's Porgy and Bess and The Color Purple. Some of Kevin's credits that I will highlight today are being a part of the original Broadway companies of Frozen, Peter and the Starcatcher and Rocky. He has performed in a myriad of off-Broadway shows, including also Peter and the Starcatcher, Love Labor's Lost, and Jacques Burrell. They are both currently two stars of the Broadway <laughs> musical, Some Like It Hot. And I saw the show around opening. So you guys have been running for a while. And so I guess I'm going to ask, and and either one of you, you can do eeny, meeny, miny, mo. There are going to be a few people listening, even though Scotty Whitman was already on the podcast talking about the evolution of the show from, from his perspective. Um, maybe one of you can just like briefly describe what the show is about for the one person who has never seen the movie or the other one person who has not yet had the privilege of seeing the show. Sure. Don't fight, guys. Don't so fight over it. No, no, no. We might as well go in. Um, so, yes, for the one one person who doesn't know, uh, Some Like It Hard is about uh, two, uh, uh, I almost said magicians, but they're musicians um, but, but in Chicago. But they do on stage. Eight shows a week is magic. That's magic right yes. there. Those but, yes, they are musicians in Chicago. They witness a mob hit. And uh, to run from the mobsters, uh, they uh, dress as women and join an all-girl band, Sweet Sue Society Syncopators, which travels across the country, and um, hilarity ensues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and we have the phenomenal uh, uh, artist, Natasha, here today, who plays Sweet Sue in the show. So mm -hmm. maybe you can just talk a little bit about how you came to be in the show and and what the journey for you was to say yes. Oh, wow. Um, I, I booked the show, I don't know, maybe two years ago. I'm not quite sure. <clears throat> I wasn't um, one of the first uh, people to do the workshops, but um, I came in during the pandemic. My voice <clears throat> came in during the pandemic and um, had a, a self-tape audition. So I sent in a tape. They sent me like three or four scenes. I watched the movie and I knew the movie and, but I had to rewatch the movie because I was like, who is Sweet Sue in the movie? I don't, I don't quite remember. I know that she was the band leader, but I, she, she had a smaller part in the, in the movie. Cause I was wondering why I got this book of like four songs and, and five scenes. And I was just like, sweet. Oh, I can't imagine who the, I'm not thinking about the right person. Anyway, I put those scenes on tape, send it in. And then I got called in, um, just as Broadway was reopening um, in October of last year uh, for an in-person callback. And so I booked it and then we here we are, here we are. We did another workshop, a in-town workshop, and then um, we opened on Broadway in December. Yeah, you <laughs> did. That's very, all of that is absolutely true. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> Um, Kevin, what about you? What was your introduction to the show? I, I had a little uh, longer history with the show. I, um, I, I was contacted by Mark Shaman, the composer uh, of the musical, um, and I didn't know Mark Shaman, so that's what made it very strange. I got this text from him saying, Hi, hello, I'm Mark Shaman, and I'd like you to record a, a demo of a musical, of, of a, a number from a musical version of Some Like It Hot I'm writing. And I was like, uh, I, don't, I don't know how you got my number. I know who you are. And yes, the answer is yes, of course. Um, so I went in and I recorded uh, this, um, this uh, demo recording of a song um, that was very difficult and I really botched it. And um, uh, I thought, well, that was my chance and I blew it. And uh, a few months later, he, he contacted me again. He said, we scrapped that song. I wrote a new one. We'd like you to come in and record this one. And so I, I thought, this is my second chance. I better not blow it. I came in, I sang the song. Everything seemed to go well. And um, uh, 
and I met Matthew Lopez, uh, the um, the book writer uh, there, and um, and I think I met Scott as well during that recording. And they told me a little bit about the project, and they said they were going to have a reading uh, coming up soon, and they invited me to be in the reading of it. So um, I suddenly wound up playing the role of Oz Good in yes. this reading uh, of the script, and. Um, uh, that's how I became involved. And this was, yeah, almost four years ago. Oh. We were supposed to go out of town yes. uh, to Chicago for tryout, for an out-of-town mm -hmm. tryout. And pandemic hit, everything shut down. And I thought, well, who knows if that'll ever happen again. And then we came back and Natasha was part of it. And yeah, had you gone to Chicago, I wouldn't have been able to, I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have been able to do it. So I'm glad, I'm not glad the pandemic happened, but certainly glad um, that this came out of, that particular me too me too and I natasha think. when you say you wouldn't have been able to do it you you mentioned you have kids is mm -hmm. that why you wouldn't have been able to go to chicago oh no 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 okay. oh no i would have done it i would have done it. I, I just wasn't a part of it at that point so okay. sweet was somebody else and um yeah sweet was somebody else before the pandemic so understood <laughs> um you know kevin for people listening is that normal well obviously getting a text on your phone not through an agent or a manager from mark shaman that is not normal but, that's not normal right that's um, abnormal that is abnormal <laughs> do you know now who the mystery like connection was connection was the matchmaker <laughs> i don't I almost, you never asked him i almost don't want to find out because i just love the story so much as this mystery i mean i have a feeling it was like telsey or someone like that but okay um but i don't know for sure i have no idea mm -hmm. Um, I had worked with Casey Nicola long ago, so I, I don't know. Maybe he threw my name in the pot. I don't know. But um, Kevin, no, this is not normal. This it is was me. It was it, me. I knew it. I knew it. You were the <laughs> third person I thought. I was like, Mark, it, I think Kevin's on vacation right now. Let's ruin it by... Because it, it's always when we're out of town or on vacation, right? Yeah, I was, Dis I was at Disney World. And so of course I like you were. <laughs> Why should we let you enjoy Disney? You need to no. be freaking out in your hotel room trying learning to learn. A song. Exactly. Right. Singing that... the song of the teacups. So Natasha and Kevin, for, for people who don't do musicals or aren't mm -hmm. really aware of what it is to build um, a show, even before it's in a rehearsal room, is getting called in by composers and lyricists to just do a demo for something that doesn't even exist. Is that normal? Is that a normal part of your life? I yeah. think that's kind of normal, yes. Yeah, Not necessarily happens. being called directly from by the composer themselves, but certainly to do demos and to um, workshop uh, pieces and try to do readings and all that kind of thing. We we do all the time to sort of get the show ready to present and see if it has legs, you know. Yeah. yeah, when people when people are putting a show together, they definitely like you know bring in whoever they know or whoever gets recommended to them. Um, to kind of put the materials together. And it is kind of an informal way to see like, are these people right for this? Mm -hmm. yeah. they're right so for it this? is. So the reason you're nervous is it's not just, I'm going to do a favor for Mark. It's, this is an opportunity for maybe me to get the part. Or at least make a good impression. Like, you know, if he likes you and you work yeah. well and, and you know, uh, he gets to know who you are and what you can do that, that you know, he'll, he'll call you in for something else or, or consider right. you when on the next demo. Yeah. So you didn't have to re-audition for the show once it was going to Broadway in earnest. Luckily, I did not. No. No. I, yeah, we I didn't. Probably time. wouldn't have gotten the part if I had to audition for it. To be honest. <laughs> Absolutely Why do you say true. that? Why do you say that? Uh, because auditioning is a whole different, different thing, and 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 I, I, you know, I, I, I don't feel like I audition well. I feel like once I'm in rehearsal and I and I feel a little comfortable and I, I can at least you know play. Um, I feel like people say, oh, I see what he can do. But auditioning is a whole. A yeah, it's whole another thing. animal. So Natasha, when you say self-tape, which is a whole, which is something that has become just how we do things now. I mean, mm -hmm. since the pandemic, it's continued to be so. Some people love the control of a self-tape that, mm -hmm. that you are in your own home and a lot of it. How, what is your relationship to self-tapes? Obviously, in this case, it was a good self-tape. <laughs> uh, how do you feel about that? I have gotten so much better with self tapes. I was the type that hated them in the beginning, um, but I I do like the fact that I can get it just I can you know angle myself or arrange the camera or the lighting or 
have a prop if I want and sort of really make um, the self tape and exchange like I feel the room is. Um, I do love the opportunity to, to, to say the lines like I think they should be said or, you know, how I choose to, to do that and then have them say, oh, that was good. Let's, let's adjust this while I'm in the room, you know, in the room, they can make adjustments and I can show them that I can take the note and do it, whatever they want. The tape is a little bit harder that way because you just have your time to tell a story. But I, I think good, good storytellers tell good stories and, um, Hopefully um, casting can can will know that and then en enable you to be called in or used at some time. But I like self-tapes now just because I've sort of I've taken a couple of classes on how to make myself technically um, savvy where they are and to just present myself the best. And that's all any self-tape is, is for you to try to present yourself in the best possible way, telling the story. Um, are there even any... Just your interpretation. If you, if you have no idea what the story is about. But your interpretation of that, right. and then they'll, you can tell a story and then give you the note to get, help you get it right, you know, help you get the story right. But I don't want to get too far from some like mm -hmm. hot, but you're talking about something that so many young actors and even seasoned actors are dealing mm -hmm. with right now, which is yeah. having to be in your own producer, director, costume designer, makeup right. artist, sound, right? So right. when you say you took a class, are there one or two things that you can share for somebody listening right now that you're like, ooh, that seems obvious now but it wasn't to me that like little tricks for self tapes that you might want to share I, I think eyeline is very important I'm not even sure I have a good one now let me see you know. um the, your eyeline is very important making sure that you're not like if you're talking to somebody you need to shake a hand that that's not on camera but you're extending so that they can tell what you're doing but not miming stuff not miming a cigarette you know none of this if you got you just pick up something make it be a cigarette I don't know but um, those kinds of things were were good for my um, in, in in learning how to present myself and just you know the horizontal and being in the frame, keeping what you're doing in the frame um, is real important. I know, and, and it seems obvious, oh, but uh, right, enough. exactly. <laughs> um, well, I will share this uh, mm -hmm. the visual of this because I think it is such important um, information for us to share with each other as we are now on this new journey of getting parts on our own yeah. um so this show has like this infectious um way of hitting everybody in the audience and you Natasha you start us off like mm -hmm. what you do and how you begin the show as this band leader lets us know what show we're at sort of mm -hmm. what the energy is going to be the joy and sort the comedy and then the real sort of life lessons that will be learned along mm -hmm. the way. So how do you get yourself ready each night? Because literally, like, obviously there's a conductor in the pit. We don't get to see the conductor in the pit. So you are our mm -hmm. orchestra leader for the evening. Right. What what does that feel like? And how do you get ready for that? Mm -hmm. How do I get ready? I, um, I generally like to walk the stage prior to everybody coming in um, and just look at the audience seats. I sort of pray and welcome the audience to receive everything we give. And then I go upstairs, I get dressed, and then I come down at the last minute right before the camera. And, and a lot of the dancers and everybody's on stage, almost everybody, if they're starting the show, will be on stage and they're warming up and stretching and kicking. And I just sort of walk, like <laughs> scan my way through it. I speak to everybody um, prior to um, me, uh, us have, we circle up in the beginning as well. But prior to that, I'm walking through the crowd of people that are legs and arms extended, laying on the floor and stretching on the furniture um, to speak to everybody and get to my corner, put on my coat. And I am so excited about asking people what it is that they want. The audience, the question, the song is, what are you thirsty for? But it really is, what is it that you need? And let me pour it out and fill the cup. And let's go on this journey together. So um, it's it's really exciting just to be able to start the show off and to start it with that question that is a song title, but is also whatever you need. We're gonna you're gonna find it in these two and a half hours. You know, we're gonna we're gonna fill your cup. Whatever you're thirsty for, you have a place here, and we're pouring. We're pouring. It's just overflowing. That is so beautiful. And You're going to leave so... drunk. <laughs> well, you do. I mean, it really, it had been a long time since I saw a musical like that, where I did feel like I left drunk. I mean, it is intoxicating. Oh, yeah. um, Kevin, what about you? Uh, you have a different 
role in this show, a different energy, certainly at the beginning. Um, and you take us on this whole love journey. So talk to me about how you get ready for your performance. I have, I kind of have the exact opposite uh, uh, um, version of, of Natasha. I enter about 50 minutes into the show. You, you know, don't so, talk to anyone in the cast and you yes, growl at them. I ignore them. them. <laughs> I, I insist they don't look me in the eye. And uh, yeah, no, I no, actually I go down every, every, uh, every show I go down and I watch the opening number because I, I want to be on that journey with everyone. I, I the, the the opening number is so exciting, so thrilling. People are jumping, leaping through the air, flipping in the air. Natasha is like commanding the stage. I, I, it, it is the thing that just like gets me ready for the show and gets me ready for this 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 kind of ride we're going to go on. And it is a ride. And I come in about fifty minutes into the ride um, to just add a completely different flavor than anybody has had. <laughs> Um, throughout, you know, I play this kind of like, you know, eccentric millionaire in the middle of a depression. Uh, and I enter when they finally arrive in California in uh, in San Diego. So the whole vibe of the of the story really kind of changes. And and this happens about three quarters of the way into the first act. So um, I, I think it's very interesting how 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 um, from from my entrance on that the, the story kind of uh, uh, takes shape and and you're right. It it's it becomes a bit of a love story from then on. My character <laughs> becomes obsessed with Daphne. You know the um, uh, uh, one of the, the 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 musicians in the show, and um, and pursues Daphne from then on. And and uh, the second act is really about these kind of um, love stories taking place. Can you talk about that? I, you and your your love interest Jay Harrison G in this show. Um, have a really, really beautiful, beautiful relationship that leaves us all wanting in our own life to meet someone who accepts us for who we are so fully. It's such an inspirational and aspirational show in that way. And it is a great departure from the original movie in terms of themes that are explored. And I wonder if you can talk about, you know, this was, um, this is interesting. It's a brand new show with a title that we recognize. So yeah. so it is not a literal translation of the movie. And I think there was a lot of um, hope by the writers who were brought on as the process went on. And, and Amber Ruffin is one of my most, I, I am in awe of her as a writer and a performer. And I feel like I can hear her voice in the show as well. You know, she was, she is, it's Matthew Lopez, Mark Shaman, Amber, Scott Whitman. Is there any other writer I'm forgetting right now on the creative team? Forgive there's, me. There's some some additional material. There's additional by. material mm -hmm. by and and I'm sure in some ways additional material by all of you because it's a mm -hmm. new show. Are there mm -hmm. things in the show that you're like I thought of that or that I pitched that and it's in? Uh not me. But I there's mean, a couple of people who did that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there are things that we that we 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 did in rehearsal that wound up in in, in, in the show. But, yeah. But uh, Joe Farrell and Christian Borrell, um added additional material and and really um uh, uh added a lot of of uh, of things as well to the book but yes i like to say that the show is like the um is in the, in the some like it hot multiverse like it is the movie it is you know everything you remember except completely different yes so, that's so... the perfect description <laughs> it's a touchstone like we know where we're starting and then it yeah. is everything everywhere all at once <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I and I um the uh, it is funny because people say like this is a complete departure from the movie, but actually the movie is very you know progressive, you know uh, in many ways. You know uh, the character Jack Lemmon plays the 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 character of of um um uh, uh what's 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 Osgood? Uh, the name is it? not Osgood, but um oh, Daphne uh, Daphne and oh, and Daphne. Um, uh, and Jerry um, and and begins to enjoy being being a woman, and and so those themes are in the movie. I think that that um, the show has just taken those themes and made it an extension uh, uh, of that. Um, and to its credit, as you say, it's 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 turned it into a more modern uh, um, take on the no. uh, on the Niall. on the piece. Um, 
Which is funny because when I was talking to Scott Whitman, he's like, yes, we changed it. And I thought he was going to say, you know, to the 90s. And he's like, it's the 1930s now, instead of like, like we <laughs> right. made it a decade later, whatever it was. I was like, wow, you really have brought it <laughs> into, right. into right. present exactly. day 70 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about what it is now that the show is running. What is going on within the company? It's the same material but with more time now to really live in it. Um, reviews are out, cr critics are done. Now it's just one night after another with people just there because they want to see it. No one has to be there because they have to. They are only there because they want to. Um, how does it feel to just have the show now and how is it changing or not changing with your characters, with your company, now that it's just yours? I want um, to, I want to like to answer that, but Kevin, I'd love for you to go first while they get their food, and then we can then the, it will have a little less noise over here. So okay. you go first. Absolutely. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the great thing about this show is that. I mean, I, first of all, I I feel like um, all the reviews came out and they're like, it's a big, brash, old fashioned musical, and I always, you know kind of bristle at that because I'm like, yes, it is a big brash old fashioned musical, but it's not dusty and boring and old fashioned. It is, you know, really alive and vibrant and full and, you know, uh, uh, um, just bursting with joy. And, and um, I, I, I still feel that I still feel like the show is very, you know, exciting and thrilling and happy and fun and um and living and and it's it's been great to be in a show that has that kind of feeling because especially after all the years that we've 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 lived through um to have something that a makes the performers who perform it feel good but b extends that to the audience that feeling you know it's great to hear the audience respond and to hear their response grow as as the the show takes hold of them and as they they start to experience and to get on that ride and to really, you know, um, as you say, you leave and they're all kind of intoxicated and it's it's been this ride that we've all gone on and we all kind of leave sort of bubbling and uh, you know, with happiness. And uh, so I, I just feel very lucky to be a part of something that, you know, can do that. Um, and to 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 be involved with with um, such a great company, I, I feel like everyone in this show is just perfectly cast, and is very committed to the to the to the piece. And it's just a joy to be um, involved with people who who work so hard and have such fun in a show that that you know just just delivers on that front. So I second that. Um, it is a, a very fortunate for us to be in the room with people who want to be in the room, uh, with actors, with creatives, with uh, even the audience who comes in and is that third that third member that is 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 working together and are happy to be in the space with each other. Um, I think each night as we go, and like you said, we're here now, now the reviewers are gone and we're just people who want to be in the room. And that's what it feels like. And whereas we're finding, constantly finding new things to tell this story and learning things as, you know, like if you go see a show, you might have to see it a couple of times to get all of the little nuances. And, and, and we're finding that every day that there's something you, you might, you come in as an actor and you might feel a certain way that day. So your character takes a little bit of a shift and then the next person goes with that. So we're just really living in the moment on the stage. And I think that's what makes it so exciting is that it does change, but it, but it is the same. And we're able to tell things or to say things that maybe the movie wasn't able to say during that time period. Um, so we're just fleshing out those those themes and things that were already there in a, a modern and current kind of twist. The show is very current. And yeah, I don't like when people say the old fashioned thing, but I, I, I know what they're trying to tap into. It is a type of show that made me want to be, be a, a musical theater performer. Um, it is the type of show that creates that energy and is that art piece that that changes people's um, life, feeling, moment, um, decision making because they are able to laugh and breathe through um, an experience. And some like it hot is I is that not only for the audience but for us as well. And I think that's what makes it so special. When you think about when you first got this show, there's always something about a part 
that can scare you a little bit, right? Like, can I, if it doesn't, it probably isn't the thing you're dying to do. Um, (laughs) Natasha, was there anything about this part that you were like this? I'm really scared of this. I thought she had to tap. (laughs) You're in a Casey Nicholas show. You never know. I thought she had to dance like, you know, like a lot. Um, so that was one of the things that was, uh, made me timid, but even in that, I was like, I can do it. You know, I have a friend, Amy Griffin, who goes around and says that all the time, or used to say that all the time, I can do it. Um, so I was only, uh, concerned about being able to, to move more than I normally would move. Um, and if I had to scat, I'm not really a scatter, but, um, but I was excited about everything else. Just being on the stage, being in the, in every moment, I, I was excited about all of that, but just. I guess a physical part of it. Almost I just have this image of you that every time they were like doing dance calls. Like, oh, I was trying to do it. I was, like, I was like, hey. <laughs> but, <laughs> Not hiding in the back row. You're like, I am the best tap dancer in this company. There, listen, there was one day we were doing that. The, that uh, There's a scene in the second act that's very, very physical. Uh-huh. And I was, hiding, I was hiding that day. And he was trying to assign parts and who was going to run and joke and run around. I was like, you know, trying to hide behind. And did it chair. work? Didn't work. He said, I'm, I had more people. I had more people in there. Natasha? Natasha? Who's available? And I was like, oh, God, here we go. So, yeah. um, But that's I, it. When, when you're in a Casey Nicholas show, like, you will be dancing at some point. And I, I definitely was, like, afraid of that because I, I, I thought, I'm an actor who moves well. I'm not, <laughs> not a dancer. And, and he will not he doesn't listen hear to that. that. He doesn't hear that. He's like, this is yeah. this is what you need to do. I believe you will be able to do it eventually. Just <laughs> practice in your kitchen, practice in your living room and show up and then I'm sure you'll do it. Well, I saw the show and and there is no part of uh, either of your performances that I thought these are just actors who move well. There are, <laughs> I mean, at, at one point, Kevin, I, I'm assuming it's still the same choreo. You were like, um, if you imagine a, I don't know, a, a, a human board game. Yes. Spinner? Yes. The spinner. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you are, I guess it's Jay. He's kind of, uh, spinning they're spinning around you the around. around. They're spinning you and you are somehow like an arrow going around and around. Um, but, but not only are you lying on the floor being pulled in a circle, you are upright dancing, um, with everybody else. And, uh, and it is really, um, I guess I want to talk about that a little bit about what it was to rehearse those scenes with Jay and how they, how the two of you sort of um, came to uh, this place of just being so magically matched with each other. Um, Was there a lot of discussion? Were you just up on your feet right away? Was there time around the table to do book work at the beginning of the process? You know, I, I should be saying yes to all of these these questions, but the answer is no. There wasn't a lot of time for book work. There wasn't a lot of discussion. Mm-hmm. It was very much like, okay, this is called a death spiral. He's going to grab onto your hand. Is that the name of that? that? Yes. Oh, that it has yes. a name. The death spiral, and the, and I'm like, you're gonna, you guys are telling me to do a death spiral. I was <laughs> terrified of this thing. Right. What does and, that mean? Uh, yeah, and I mean, you know, they, let me tell you, it was there was a, a lot of times where I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Like I, I, I'm, I'm just like you know, flailing around on the ground here. Um, but somehow, like you know, Jay's like, "I'm not gonna drop you. I'm not gonna let you, you know, fall." And that's been, you know, the the dynamic. It's like you know, you're up there with one another. People mm-hmm. are telling you this is what has to happen, and we're gonna make it happen together. You know, and through that kind of um, you know, uh, uh, I guess, um, just discipline, just, just, you know, constant discipline and faith and faith and, and, and necessity. You learn how to, how to work with one another. You learn what needs to be done. You're, you're, everyone's getting on the same page because you're all, you know, pulling together in the same way. And, um, and things start to fall in place. As Natasha says, like new things are found, you know, the more comfortable you get with something, the more a moment grows, the more a, 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 a certain line takes a little bit more, you know, um, uh, um, you know, a line becomes a little bit more interesting or profound, or you find something in it and, and the other person reacts to it. And I think that's been kind of the way that things have grown between me and Jay in our scenes. 
um, it was interesting when when uh, in previews Jay uh, uh, had to be out and and um, his uh, uh, cover went on, and um, I had just grown you know so so um, taken taken so much of that for granted that suddenly when it was gone I was like oh my gosh there are so many moments that we haven't discussed that we haven't like you know had big roundtable discussions about that are just gone and and you realize the importance of them now how how much they they contribute to everything you're doing. And so um, it's, yeah, it was, it's been a fascinating thing to, to feel the evolution of it, you know. Natasha, do you have a favorite? I mean, that's the beauty of the long run. It, it can ebb and flow, but is there is there a favorite part of the night that you really look forward to in the show? Um, wow, I look forward to definitely that, that opening number. Um... I look forward to that, but I also look forward to one of the the, the dressing room scene at the end when I um, find out a, a, a particular part of the journey yeah. um, has happened. I look forward to that um, because Sue is just so big and brassy and just you know making decisions, and she's the boss and all that kind of stuff. And then there's a moment of her humanness that is um, for just a second. I, I I'm hurt, and then I have to go on and make a decision to push through. Um, so I really look forward to that and having, being able to just sort of feel something different than what's been going on the whole show. And I um, just want to say that moment mm -hmm. of vulnerability that you're mm -hmm. describing is mm -hmm. so poignant as an audience mm -hmm. member. It, oh, yeah. I, I really felt that, like, I really felt that. And it's funny because you never want to tell an actor, like one of your favorite things or favorite mm -hmm. jokes. You're like, great, mm -hmm. I'll never do that again. Yeah, but right. I do, I do. <laughs> have to say that there was a humanity mm -hmm. um I mean not to say that there isn't tremendous humanity right. and 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 we also we presume a lot about sweet Sue's life knowing historically what was going on in the world right. and 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 what it took for her to be who she is and mm -hmm. conquer an industry in the way that you do I mean it's she's such a role model for mm -hmm. everyone um yeah. a, a, even today like i mean mm -hmm. a woman sure. who is the boss we're sure. still like getting used to that right? right right um and so that when you when you just show us the side of sweet sue that maybe is reserved only for her at home mm -hmm. and we get to see it publicly it's right. astonishingly beautiful Yay. um okay. And I feel like your show, what is, you know, whatever you want to call it, I think some of the genius of, of Casey's casting mm -hmm. is, um, is how he allows everyone in this show that on some level we think we know, and we think this, these are stock characters, these are, these are archetypes that we understand. Mm -hmm. And as mm -hmm. you watch this show, there's an undoing of archetype for everybody, not mm -hmm. just the obvious journey that Jay goes on or, or mm -hmm. Daphne's character goes mm -hmm. on. That is a complete beautiful surprise. And mm -hmm and a departure. Um, mm -hmm. But it really is a testament to to an incredible company, Adriana Hicks and Christian Borle. I mean, there is a, a level of comedic skill going on from, you know, every single performer and your ensemble as well. They are being asked to cover mm -hmm. one million roles, but also sing and dance like no human being is meant to be able to do with comedic timing. Like mm -hmm. everyone in your show is doing what they do at at an extraordinary level. Um, and it's a privilege to watch all of you. I guess before I let you go, because the fact that you do the show eight shows a week and took time to do this today is just such a blessing for my listeners. And I'm so grateful to both of you, not just for your performances, but your generosity of spirit mm -hmm. in, in all the ways you guys Mm -hmm. um inhabit your role in this industry I, I you know in researching you the amount of charity work you both do the amount of of places you lend your voices to for free because mm -hmm. it's an organization or something you really care about is um is no small thing especially when you're in a run of something so a thank you for being such generous humans beyond um what most people do um before I let you go, um, and it's going to feel like a trick question, but remembering it's called the Little Known Facts Podcast, it shouldn't be oh, no. the most insane. Um, is there uh, a little known fact 
about you, Kevin, that you can share. And then Natasha, you get a second to vamp and think while <laughs> while Kevin's on the spot. And any air that we have can be snipped out in the edit. So it'll seem like you, uh, <laughs> you it doesn't have to be something, you know, um, beyond your comfort level. Okay. Um, let me see a little known fact. Um, I mean, I don't know how little known it is. It's funny because I, 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 I have many careers. I'm a man of, 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 many, <laughs> of schizophrenic careers. I've got several <laughs> things going. So it depends on who you talk to about what's little known about me. I mean, listeners to your, to your, your podcast may not know that I, for a couple of years, I was the head writer of Blues Clues. Um, they may not know that, like, I, you know, I, I have a whole, you know, I've won Emmys writing like children's television shows. I, I, um, I was the voice of a troll in Frozen. Um, I, 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 I wrote a song. I wrote the lyrics for a song that was in the Disney movie uh, Strange World that came out last year. I've got a very weird, eclectic life. So I feel like everything about me is little known. <laughs> Can I add to that, my beautiful listeners? Uh, you wrote Alter Boys. Yes, yes. If anybody remembers yes, Alter the Boys, way. there's another um, little known fact. <laughs> those of us of a certain age know it. Yes. yes. Well, Kevin, bravo. Those were all fantastic and little known to, to many. So bravo. Thank you. Natasha, if you told me you also wrote uh, on Blue's Clues, I'm I'm done. That would be little known. That would be little known to anyone. That would be little known by me. That would also be untrue. Yes. <laughs> little known lies. Yes. <laughs> I um I have a little known fact that maybe people don't know. I majored in math education. I was going to be a math teacher and actually was a math teacher for a year um, at a uh, high school in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina called Westover High School before moving to New York to pursue acting full-time. I also made, made double majored actually uh, when I was at North Carolina Ante of uh, in speech communications and theater arts with math and math education. But um, so that's a little, I'm a, I used to be a mathematician. I don't remember any of it now, <laughs> but uh, that's what I started to be. I, I, I was going to be an actress, but my 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 parents were of the a uh, generation that said you had to have something to fall back on. So um, it was going to be to teach math. So that's, that's a little beautiful. fact about me. Wow. I don't have as many because every I'm, I'm an open book. Wow. <laughs> well, I cannot thank you both enough for being on the podcast today. And uh, I, <clears throat> I hope to sneak back in to see the show again and see how it's grown and has become even more passionate, exciting and um, and familial. Right. I mean, you guys mm -hmm. are full on family now. Yes. So, all right. Well, I wish you both the most beautiful day. And thank you. Thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.